Marshallis yet, but we have representatives from, from uh, Guyana and, and Haiti and some of the other islands. So it's uh, quite a nice gathering of uh, folks representing the islands. Okay. Yeah. So, and I think we, uh, we, uh, we all help each other out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's important to pass. Now, I want to just jump right into it, and I want to start with the former ambassador, Dr. Rudy Webster. Now, as all of us have heard, in the Obama administration, there's a lot of talk about change, change, change. Now, we hear about a lot of the change in the U.S., but how is this change going to affect the Caribbean? Well, you know, I can't predict that at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I can only tell you what the, the possibilities right. are. Right. But, um, you know, change is probably man's greatest motivator. Okay. And um, Obama, Obama, President Obama, won the election because of change. Right. You know, okay. um, articulating change is difficult and formulating it. But he has got a much bigger job ahead of him. Okay. That is to get, get the people to embrace the change and then to implement it. Okay. That is where the challenge is going to lie. But I think that he has already changed the world and that he has uh -huh. aroused just about every country in the world. Wow. And, and has generated a lot, of, a lot of interest already. But what I, I think he understands that the world is such an interconnected and interdependent system at the moment that um, he is going to have to change the relationships that America mm. has with most of the countries around the world. And I think one of the things that he wants to do from the very beginning is to reestablish a very positive image of the United States, okay. in, in, even among the friends of the United States. But if you listen to Obama's words, uh, I think they tell a story about where, he go, where he's going and what he wants to do. And he, he, says, uh, he says to the world that America will be a friend of every nation, every man, woman, and child. Uh -huh. And then he went on to say, and we are prepared to lead once more, which is a very, very good sign. To the autocratic nations, he said, look, you are on the wrong side of history. But we are prepared to extend a hand to you if you are willing to unclench your fist. Uh -huh. And to developing countries, and this is very important for us, he says, we place to work alongside you to help you to make your farms more efficient, to get clean waters to flow, to nourish starving bodies, and to satisfy the hungry minds. Mm. And then he went on to say that um, um, we can no longer um, show indifference to difficulties um, in territories outside of our borders, nor can we continue to consume the world's resources without regard for effect. And this is important, he said, for the world has changed and we have got to change with it. Now, this is to the American audience. Right. And uh, that is very important. But I think it is more important for us in the Caribbean to change even more than the, than, than, mm. than the Americans because we have got to capitalize on the opportunities that, that Obama's, President Obama's change might bring about. Now, I know years ago, um, there was a prime minister in the Caribbean who said that we are friends, we in the Caribbean are friends of all nations and satellites of none. Wow. I think that um, feeling still is there. But um, I think we in the Caribbean, uh, although we have to be friends with everyone, we have to know who our friends are. Right. And we have to know who our good friends are and we have to know who our best friend is. <laughs> and I think that that is pretty obvious. But I think that uh, the leaders in the Caribbean are going to have to manage their relationship with the United States a bit better. Okay. It must not be a dependent relationship as it has been in the past, like a father-child relationship. Nor must it be an independent relationship where you have one partner being rebellious, like some of the ladies around, you know. It must be an interdependent relationship that okay. is mutually beneficial, uh -huh. where both partners are playing um, uh, a 
an equal part. I think that this is, but, but the key to it, I think, for us in the Caribbean, since we don't have all the resources that you have here, um, years ago a psychologist said, the greatest discovery of our time is that man, by changing the inner aspect of his mind, can change the outer aspect of his life. Uh. This is what we have to do. We have to change our beliefs and our thinking. And this is going to be the biggest obstacle of all, not just for the Caribbean, but for the United States. Okay. And with that, um, I would like to address um, Vin Martin. Okay, and he is the honorary Cons consulate. Honorary. Yes, he is the honorary consulate of consul for um, Jamaica and he resides here in Atlanta. And I would like to find out a little bit more about the Caribbean Basin Initiative. And do you think that President Obama and his administration is gonna take another look at this initiative and um, what will we expect? Well, let me just give you briefly my take on, on that. Mm -hmm. The Caribbean Basin Initiative, of course, is, um, it has been in place for some for many years, probably mm -hmm. 20 years, mm -hmm. and was quite successful initially. Mm -hmm. And of course, as most of you listening might recall, mm -hmm. during the Cold War and during the, the, the rise of communism, etc., there was an interest in ensuring that some of the other countries in the Caribbean go the way that the U.S. saw Cuba go. Mm -hmm. So part of the CBI, as they call it, was an effort mm -hmm. to ensure that there was some more economic stability out of the country, encourage investments, and ensure that there was a market in the United States mm -hmm. for goods coming out of the Caribbean. They were, to, I mean, it's a legal structure mm -hmm. um, based upon the laws at the time, which ensured that there were some protections of tariffs mm -hmm. that were um, lessened in order to, to get these things into uh, the United States. Now, this, had, this was watered down over the years when mm -hmm. they enacted what they call NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Area of mm -hmm. the Americas, mm -hmm. which included um, Mexico, the United States, and Canada. Right. And so many of the, the tariffs and the, the benefits mm -hmm. for C the CDI were exported to these uh, to these to other countries. And so a lot of the manufacturers who were then um, investing in our um, respective countries through the Caribbean left and, and went to Mexico because of the benefits. I don't know that the CBI has a place, um, has to be resurrected at this point because most recently, Right. The Western Hemisphere mm -hmm. tried to enact what they call the Free Trade Area of the Americas, mm -hmm. which included 34 countries, um, North America, South America, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. That did not work, and mm -hmm. that is probably what you're going to find people going back to, breaking mm -hmm. down tariffs through this entire more um, extended re um, region. The other thing that the United States has engaged in a bilateral agreement. Mm -hmm. And these, uh, we, while there is not a bilateral agreement specifically between the CARICOM countries and the United States at this time, I can see the Obama government heading in that direction. But insofar as mm -hmm. there are still benefits to be mm -hmm. had from the CBI, I would expect that those will continue because it, what was a, initially a trial period for CBI mm -hmm. has now been created, uh, we have now created an indefinite mm -hmm. um, period for this particular relationship. Okay, thank you. Good. Okay, now going back to Dr. Webster. Now, I know you touched on this in the last question, but if you had to put, I guess you could say your top two or three priorities that the Pre President Obama's administration should have towards the Caribbean, what would you, would you say those priorities would be? Well, um, I can't answer that. Right? Okay. <laughs> okay. Because I don't think that Obama, President Obama's administration has given much thought to the Caribbean at this stage. Okay. At a similar stage, uh, when President Clinton came in, I, I was in Washington at the time. Okay. And at this period of, of, the, uh, of time, of the, of the administration, they had not given any thought at all to the Caribbean. So right. what a couple of us did, we organized a meeting of five Caribbean heads with uh, President Clinton. Okay. And I think. Uh, we were the first people that he met after President Menem. And um, the leaders were then able to sit down uh, at, at a luncheon, a 
and tell him what the needs of the Caribbean were, what the concerns, what the anxieties. In other words, they told him what the Caribbean needed right. and what the Caribbean was prepared to do for America in return. Okay. And that was that would then that focused that focuses administration on the sort of things that uh, as you say would become priorities and stuff like that. What I suggest is that somebody or, or some of the leaders could get together and request a meeting like that. Okay. Because I don't think that too much thought has been put into that area. Okay. I would like to direct this question to Dr. Lang. Do you think that the Caribbean economic um, issues are on President Obama's agenda right now? Well, I mean, the short answer to that is no. <laughs> and uh, okay. the reason is exactly what Dr. Webster, uh, what the former ambassador said uh, earlier, and uh, I think what uh, we've been touched on. Um, President Obama, let's think about it, comes into office with some major challenges on mm -hmm. his plate. And mm -hmm. he's got um, uh, two wars, mm -hmm. one in Afghanistan and uh, one uh, in Iraq. Uh, mm -hmm. he's, got, uh, um, he's got conflicts at home uh, over where an ec his economic policy should be, and he's got an economy that's tanking. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's unreasonable, I think, it would be unreasonable of us in the Caribbean to expect that that he's going to be uh, worried about the economic issues of the Caribbean at this time. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that the Caribbean leaders, I think they're smarter than that. They, they understand that, the, that the, the major challenges that are facing him uh, have got to be dealt with. And we really wish him well in that and are very supportive in, in, in that area. I think eventually, the, I think the question you're asking me is um, in his heart of hearts, does he want to help the Caribbean uh, economically, and I think the answer to that is yes. I think that eventually, whether it'll be in this term or in the next term, I, I really don't know. But I think eventually he will come around and will really sit with the Caribbean le uh, leaders uh, in some sort of forum, as Dr. Webster said, and, uh, and look to see how we can help each other. Because we are neighbors, and we've mm -hmm. always been good neighbors, and we want to continue to be good neighbors, and he knows that. And so I think the answer, the short answer is, are we on the radar screen now? The answer is no. Will we be on the radar screen? I think the answer is yes. He doesn't want us to be on. Okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, just jump in. Sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, bear yeah. in mind that there is a meeting of the Latin American and Caribbean countries with the, um, yes. with um, President Obama in April in Trinidad and Tobago. That is correct. That is While correct. they may not be um, at the time when they would focus on the needs per se of the Caribbean exclusively, um, mm -hmm. to, the, to the exclusion of the other um, Latin American mm -hmm. countries. It's an opportunity for them to formulate mm -hmm. some, some ideas as to what they would want mm -hmm. to present to it, probably in a subsequent meeting. But I think the critical thing here is this. If the American economy recovers, the mm -hmm. Caribbean benefits, we will not start talking about the uh, well, it may not be mm -hmm. dependence per se, mm -hmm. but the, the indirect benefit Mm -hmm. you know, if it's travel in the tourism mm -hmm. industry, right. if it's mm -hmm. remittances out of the, the out of the United States into the Caribbean, as soon as the American benefits, I mean, the economy starts to grow and, and reestablish itself, mm -hmm. we can see, we can expect to see mm -hmm. the real benefit for us. And isn't the Caribbean speaking a lot of, um, as far as energy resources? to not to go into more fossil fuels, but go into clean energy, and that is one of Obama's main topics, is clean energy. Well, so it's clean energy for us, but for, for, for many of us, it's even more than just clean energy. It's the fact that the cost mm -hmm. to our countries mm -hmm. for um, the current types of fuel that mm -hmm. exist mm -hmm. um, are so high mm -hmm. that we have to look to, mm -hmm. to alternative sources of energy. Mm -hmm. And as uh, um, where we have lots of wind and sunshine, mm -hmm. I think we should take advantage of that without mm -hmm. um, question. Now, we also know though that the U United States mm -hmm. um, buys 80% of the natural gas that Trinidad. Trinidad and Tobago produces. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, for the Trinidad and Tobago um, economy, that's, that's an important uh, consideration. Mm -hmm. I don't think they would um, be reluctant, however, to look at alternative um, sources of, mm -hmm. of um, energy for their own um, consumption within the country so they can have more to export. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have a question. I mean, it's going to be directed to you, Dr. Webster, but I know I've been seeing you out, so anyone can jump in yeah. on this. Now, I believe the last president to meet with CARICOM leaders was Clinton back in 97. I know it's early, as we mentioned in the administration, but throughout his term, and if he makes a second term, hopefully he does, um, 
somewhere along that line, how is the, along those that line, how important is it for him to meet with Caricom leaders? Would you say? President Obama. Obama. Right. Pre President Obama. Obama yes. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's it's very very important. After all, his attorney general is a Barbadian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah I, I, I think that um, I think that he will reach out to the leaders, and I think that the Caribbean leaders will reach out to him as well. And I think that that we will have a mutually beneficial relationship, a slightly different relationship from the one we've had right. over the last eight years. Because uh, you may not know that, know this here in mm -hmm. the United States. I think Obama is loved more in the Caribbean than he's loved in the United <laughs> oh, States. Oh, yeah. 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 something. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. But yeah, I sure. think it's important that they establish um, mm -hmm. rapport and, um, and a good, strong relationship. Because, you know, we are small countries. Mm -hmm. But when you look at our history, I mean, the things that America value most um, democracy and freedom and stuff like that. We've had that in the Caribbean now for a very, very long time. In my island, Barbados, we, I mean, we have a parliament that is nearly 360 years old, you know. So we have traditions and stuff like that that uh, the United States is trying to, our values that they're trying to promote around the world to other new countries. Well, we can be a model for some of those countries. And so I think that it's important that we have a special relationship the United States. Mm -hmm. Yes, and thank you so much for that information. And right here, we're talking to Dr. Lang. We're speaking with Dr. You know, Webster. Do Dr. Webster and Ben Martin. And we have here Dedrick, and we're coming at you right here from Caribbean Report. And um, we would like to say, please join us each and every Friday at 7 o'clock right here at People's TV. Channel 24 Comcast, and also you could see us on People TV, www.peopletv.org. And if you go to the upper right hand corner, you can go and see us live streaming. And also, we have a website we can go to yeah. www.myspace.com backslash Atlanta Caribbean Report, and we have all our information as far as news and various guests. So please. Come and stay tuned and uh, visit with us and learn more about the Caribbean and our culture. Thank you. Very good. Very good. And, and I was just going to add, it's those of you who watch our show all the time in the past, we normally advertise the phone number on here. Now, with all these powerful people <laughs> and all the information we're trying to give you, we may not, we probably won't have time to take calls. But what I'd like to say, if you want to call in and leave a message for one of them, please feel free to do so. And that number is 404 eight seven three one three four nine again that's four zero four eight seven three one three four nine if you have any questions and also you can um, send us the information on our website that's right. which is that's at right. www dot and um, myspace.com backslash Atlanta Caribbean report right. and you can give us all the information you need and that Drake or myself will Email you and contact get, get you and you. answer all of your questions. All right, thanks, thanks. And again, just to recap, we, we were focusing tonight mm -hmm. on President Obama and the relation to the Caribbean, because this is the Caribbean report. And as you know, the election just happened a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And the, the next area, uh, like the, well, before I do that, um, is there any questions or topics that any of you would like to bring out as it relates to? your island in particular, whether it's Barbados, whether it's Jamaica, and what you would like to see with this administration? Well, not particular at this time. You know, okay. we, are, we are very reasonable people here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah. again, I think it bears uh, repeating that to expect the President of the United States to focus on any other country but its own, his own, at Correct. this time, right. when, the, when the country is going through so much trauma, um, unemployment, housing, um, foreclosures, all Everything. of these issues mm. that we all know about, mm -hmm. then for any of us from outside of this country to expect that the president would be looking elsewhere at this stage would be, to me, would be quite insensitive. Okay. So we are just now at this stage living inside yeah. the United yeah. States of America. We are rooting for the U.S. Yeah. for the president to turn this whole
problem right. around right. and to get the, this country back to the position of prominence and leadership right. Mm -hmm. right. that he is so, right. um, so intent on doing. Right. What I can also see is because of President Obama's administration and all the things that they have to do here, all right, it would greatly affect globally by them, you know, streamlining, getting it together, and also making it very um, prosperous for us, resolving these issues. Right. In the Caribbean, we will definitely benefit one way or another. Right. And I, you know, you I, know, I, so. I, I absolutely agree with, uh, with uh, Vivian Martin. And just, I know we've only got a couple of minutes left. Yeah. And I, yeah, and I, I wanted to, um, I wanted to address a question that you and I had chat, chatted about earlier uh, before the show, um, and that is, you know, Dr. Webster, since we have Dr. Webster here, and he spends his whole life dealing with uh, conflict resolution, I mean, you've got enormous uh, conflicts here. I mean, you've got a president that comes in and he's faced with a conflict in, the, in Afghanistan, a conflict in, uh, in Iraq, uh, and conflicting views at home about how to deal with, a, with an economy that's tanking. Uh, you're, you spend your whole life dealing with conflicts. Where do you start? Where does he start? Well, let, let me give you a, quickly a theoretical model. Yeah. Right? Now, there, there are basically four ways that you can uh, um, deal, deal with, with a conflict. The first and the most popular and the least effective is the fight idiom. Very popular with the lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> that is, you know, you state your position or I state my position and we argue hmm. and uh, we get all heated up and I demonize you and you demonize me and then we stop listening to each other right. and then we start shouting at the other. And eventually we end up in a fight, right? right? Mm -hmm. We go to war. That is, that is one way. That is the most popular one. The second one is you have a problem identify the cause and remove it. Uh, remove the dictator and democracy will flourish. Well, we know that doesn't work and that's another very effective way. But at the moment, these seem to be the two most popular methods that are being used in mm -hmm. foreign affairs. The third way is compromise. That is, you take up your position, I take up my position. You give up something, I give up something. And we end up somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. And this is how the diplomats work. But we're not creating anything new because we are thinking and resolving our conflict in the same in box. Mm -hmm. The fourth one is the, probably the most important, and that is what we call design thinking, where we get together, design what we want to achieve, and work as a team to achieve it. The fight idiom, which is very popular, is a win-lose situation. The design idiom is a win-win situation. That is preferable. Sometimes you have to use a combination of them. But war, um, the fight idiom, which is the most popular, is the one that you should use as a last resort. The Honorable Mark, the from Jamaica, do you think we should send him to Washington? Yes, <laughs> definitely. Yes, we do need him. Fantastic, right next to Obama, because I that's absolutely. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, very succinct and very well, very well put. That is awesome. That's that is awesome. awesome. Yeah, well, that's fantastic. And I knew there was a reason that we were bringing we're you on the show. Yes. But then it is so nice of you to 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 join, to, us. To join us. And uh, I know you had a busy schedule. And you've just come back in from the lovely island of Jamaica, and. Uh, oh, yeah, right. uh, and we, we, we caught Dr. Webster, oh. he was traveling. Can I ask something very quickly? Sure. With your short trip to Jamaica, what are, what are the people's reaction to B Obama's winning? Mm -hmm. President oh, Obama, excuse me. Put it this way. I saw cars with Obama stickers say, I voted for Obama. Oh. Really? <laughs> 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 so, 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 wow. Well, that, that is awesome. That is awesome. So, so, in fact, Jamaica has Republicans and Democrats. That's also they think. And, they, um, uh, and I say, oh, when we meet, um, Obama would have won this election in Jamaica. Uh, <laughs> uh, so he yeah. is well received globally. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is just a phenomenon. Right. So, yeah. Okay. It's, it's, it's funny because I, I came home from the, uh, from the election and there was, a, uh, there was a call on my, on my phone from a good friend in London and I really thought his wife was sick. It, was a death, uh, it looked almost like a, a, an urgent call, it said. And so uh, this is a guy who was uh, 
the deputy speaker of the House of Parliament at one time, and he said, and the message on the machine, he said, finally, your Americans got some common sense. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, I think that globally, uh, the whole, uh, the uh, President Obama's uh, election was well received, and it was, of course, well received in the Caribbean, as you said. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I think Caribbean Americans here in, in the uh, Atlanta area uh, are really looking forward to, um, to, the, to the future under this administration, as are people all over the country, of course. Right. 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 Yes, so he has good. amazing support. Yeah. Amazing support. Right, good. Now, I know we're close to our time, but I just, but well, let me stress this for those of you who are watching us for the first time. Where can you get information like this for free? This is a pay-per-view now. <laughs> You're getting all of this for free. So please continue to watch us and any questions, comments that you have, yeah. let us know because this is not just our show. This is your show and we're here to provide this information to you. Yeah. Now going back to what you all mentioned on impact. Now I said this last week, but just to throw out a little island tidbits on what's going on with Obama in Antigua. The highest peak in Antigua is going to be named for President Obama. It's going to be called Mount in the, in the Obama next, next in Antigua. That's just one example in Montserrat. If you go to the Montserrat Reporter on the front page still, it still talks all about Obama. So just quick tidbits on that. But I know we're close to running out of time, not of the show, for this segment of the show. And if there's any other... Yes, um, yes. Caribbean Report will love to present the health segment that's coming up next, the health mm -hmm. show, with, which is with Dr. Lang. Okay, Dr. Lang. And we're going to have some great things coming up there. What they're going to be talking about is cancer. And um, we have featured guests. They're going to talk about personal stories mm. of overcoming cancer and how to beat it. Mm. And especially you women out there, you need to listen to this because we have a lot of obstacles and we're gonna get very good information because we have talent here that is gonna get you prepared for anything and everything. Mm. Well, yeah, Karen, you're also always such a flatter. <laughs> <laughs> Le poste, l'auto à son maxi, que le monde entende le message. D'un simplement en sursis, seul notre fortune fait l'indifférence. Dans le fond, on est les mêmes, pour un million de raisons différentes. Je suis venu dire qu'un homme, un vrai, choisit toujours et qu'il est prêt au pire quand c'est l'honneur de la famille qui se joue. Que dès qu'un vent se bourre, dès qu'un courant son secours, que 6 millions de personnes vivent dans la pauvreté à ce jour. Reste digne, mais rogneux, fais mieux, puis fais le. Trop d'âme vénéneuse, c'est l'esprit haineux, cette haine me désole, mais nous fait stank, des rangs des deux, trop d'esprit dégueu. Mon seul vœu, c'est de voir le cesser le feu. On a la même chance que, sache-le, on a pris tant de bleu, mais tant mieux, à force, on défiera les envieux, c'est quand tu veux. Je me lève à chaque épreuve, et lorsque les coups pleuvent, je ne puis m'empêcher de m'en remettre à queue. Je la tête On n'est pas condamné à l'échec Ha 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 Les jeunes de cité aussi peuvent y arriver Ouais, ouais. 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 Avec de fois plus de volonté On peut grimper et parvenir jusqu'au sommet yeah. Scarla Lève de ta vie toi et sur ton sort Relève la tête, regarde, non ça n'est pas mort Dis-toi, celui qui veut s'en sort Sors du ghetto et de ses mauvais sorts Tu sais ta choix. choix, ta vie est-ce que tu en fais oh, oh. Cacher un navire à la vie Message du cœur, passe le sauveur des sœurs, plaque ou bien chanter. Tête de tapis toi et sur ton sort. Relève la tête, regarde, non, ça n'est pas mort, dis-toi. Celui qui veut s'en sort, sort du ghetto et de 
éviter Et dans les cailles, on est des déshérités Le trafic d'influence va toujours vous profiter L'inégalité, une fréquente fatalité Votre aéromédie, un bon changement de mentalité Dans l'intimité, manipuler l'actualité Assister pour nous déconnecter de la réalité Votre morale, les corales et la complexité De vos propos, le fond de votre sincérité Affronter, ne serait-ce qu'effleurer la vérité Et constater la nécessité well, welcome back to Caribbean Report. Uh, this is the health segment of Caribbean Report, and we are happy to have you all on board. Tonight we have some very special guests for you. I'm Dr. Edward Lane, one of the hosts for the show. And we have also Dr. Mack, the, the other host of the show. And tonight we have some very, very special guests for you. But before we do, before we introduce the guests, let's just back up a little and uh, remind you that President Obama uh, said that his health initiative was to make sure that America becomes a much healthier place with a mu at a much cheaper cost than we are paying now for our health. And um, he wanted to promote preventive health. And we want to discuss an area today of preventive health and show you how by practicing preventive health uh, you can not only save lives, but you can decrease the cost of health care. Uh, today, we are going to talk about, uh, we'll speak about colon cancer as one form of preventive health. And then we will also, in the, second, uh, in, in the same segment, we will show you uh, another a gentleman who has practiced preventive health all of his life. And uh, he, we will show you how, by he was able to beat a very debilitating disease because he had practiced preventive health all his life and he was able to use the, uh, the, the, the skills that he had learned in preventive health uh, to beat this disease. Now, let me introduce to you the two special guests of the show. The first is, uh, I would just call her Mrs. Paula. Hello. And uh, Paula is, uh, uh, first of all, we're very proud of you. We're proud of you for um, having, having used your knowledge to have yourself screened in a preventive way for, and the area here this is colon cancer, uh, you were able to beat this, and now you said, well, I want to share my experience with other women to save lives. That is awesome, and we are very proud of you. Thank you. And of course, on the other side of the set, we have uh, Dr. Rudy Webster, who is uh, in his own right very distinguished. He used to, those of you who watched the last segment of the show saw him. He's the former ambassador to Washington, but he's also uh, an incredible um, uh, physician, motivator, and uh, a practitioner of uh, some of the healing arts that I want him to talk to us about tonight to show us how he healed himself from a very debilitating disease where he can now play golf again when he was told he would never be able to walk. And then tell us how to do that, please. Uh, well, Dr. Mack, I know you had some questions of, uh, for Paula. So why don't you start us off? Well, well Dr. Lane, I just wanted to ask you a question first. Um, let us understand why colon cancer screening is so important, and especially after the age of 50. Right. Well, Dr. Mack, um, colon cancer is one of, the, uh, one of the cancers that we can absolutely cure. We, can, we know now what we have to do to, to really, if not prevent it, to catch it in a very, very early stage with what's called colon cancer screening. And uh, the process there involves passing a lighted tube up the colon, which is about eight feet long. We can examine almost the entire length of the colon. We can find the lesions that would turn to cancer. They start as little moles, like little moles on the skin, but they grow on the inside of the colon. And you can remove these completely and the patient is cured. And we can catch them often before they turn to cancer. Now, why 50? Because we know that they grow uh, much faster after age 50. Uh, well, very good. Now, I understand our guest Paula has an incredible story to tell us about um, having her colon screening done and especially um, at this moment she just turned 50 and I don't, and I don't <laughs> believe that but <laughs> that's what I said I but, don't uh, believe that but we'll, 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 admit, we'll accept it 
<laughs> so I just wanted to know, um, is it something for everyone just above the age 50, or do we have to look at someone that is younger than 50 years of age? Right, yeah, the question you're asking me is whether you have to, everyone has to wait until they're 50 uh, to get screened. And the answer to that, really a short answer, is no. Um, cancer is no respecter of age. If you will recall, for those of you who watched the show last, for those of you who watched the show last week, remember we had a gentleman, a young gentleman here in his 40s who had developed colon cancer and who was smart enough to catch it early because he followed some simple rules. And the simple rules for the people who are less than 40 is that one, if you see certain things happening, you have to get yourself screened. And we can talk about those things later, but I will tell you now that I will tell the audience that you can go to our, our website, MyPHVoice, www.myphvoice, and you can download the, all the things that you should be looking for uh, to, um, as signals that you should go get yourself screened. Of course, everyone knows if you see a spot of blood in your stool, but really the, the earliest sign is if you have a change in your bowel habits, if you find that you're suddenly becoming constipated or suddenly becoming or having diarrhea when you didn't have this. And so, uh, but otherwise, when you turn 50, and uh, uh, Paula turned 50, as she told us, so tell us what happened to you, Paula. <laughs> well, what happened is me and my husband, after turning 50, my husband insisted I take a uh, colon test. You were kicking and screaming, right? Yeah, I was kicking and screaming <laughs> because I had no symptoms. I, nothing was wrong with me. I was eating normal and basically just going about my business. And then I started feeling just kind of slightly tired all the time and stuff. And he just kept insisting and kept insisting. And so we went to Dr. Lane which is a very good person because he had also went to Dr. Lane, had the test done, and uh, Dr. Lane took care of him. And so I had the test done. And um, then Dr. Lane told me that he wanted me to have um, a test. And when he found out that I had polyps, he removed them, and um, yeah. I mm -hmm. felt better. I, I did much better. Dr. Lane is good. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, the object of the show is not to law Dr. Lane, <laughs> but I appreciate your, I appreciate your, 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 your flattery. Um, but, you know, the, the, the point here is that Paula had no symptoms. No. And as you know, Dr. Dr. Mack, uh, that is the most common symptom, the most common finding, exactly. that the patient has no symptoms. And, that is, and so that's the message that we want to take home. Uh, at age 50, uh, at age 50, everyone should get screened. Now, the other reason that Paula said she wanted to come on was because at about the same week that you had this, Paula, uh, you remember we were, I was telling you that an article had just been published that said that black women, uh, I, I don't know whether it's in America or just black women all over, we don't know that yet, because we haven't done all the studies, may have as much as an 80% increased risk of colon polyps. And we don't really know why. And so here I re I'm reading this article and then pa Paula comes in and we said, well, let's get this message out to the world. Yes. And Paula was fantastic. Uh, Paula, how did you feel? I mean, what was your reaction when I told you that you had this large... Lesion? I was shocked. I really was because I showed no symptoms. Um, we talk about it all the time about other people with cancer and you meet people with cancer, but you never think that it could happen to you. You be just going on every day with your normal activities and going to work and doing things that you just, you don't think about yourself getting sick. And I was one of those people because I don't get sick. I pretty much live a good life now, no medication, you know, not thinking that I'm sick or anything is happening with my body you are not looking for it because you don't see any symptoms. You don't have any symptoms. And you eat normal, you live in normal, and you're trying to exercise. And nothing was happening. And so it was the last thing that I thought was happening with me because nothing was happening. Right. So, but if it wasn't for, you know, Dr. Lang and my husband, this is hard, and God <laughs> taking <laughs> care of me, insisting uh, that when you get 50 you need to go have the test done right. so you, i advise all women don't play with this this is nothing to play with this is very serious if i had waited and kept waiting 
I don't know what would have happened, mm -hmm. other than the fact that I would have been sick then, yes. and I might couldn't have caught it in right, time. Right. So I advise all women, black, white, whatever, Latino, whatever, go have a test done. 50 is the age, and everybody has said, go have a test done, and I thought, no, not me. Yeah. But yes, me. Yeah. You do need to have that we done. We are so proud of you. We are Thank so proud you. of you. Now, is there anything that you've changed after finding out? Just my uh, eating habits. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, the fact that I'm telling everybody you need to be screening more, you need to be going to your doctors more, because what happens is when you don't feel sick and you don't think you're sick, you don't go to the doctor. And I think preventive care is better. If you go and have a physical at least once a year and have it tested, that makes you feel better to know. Um, some people might need to go more than once a year, but at least go once a year. And I think that now, since I am, um, not to get scared of anything, but you do need to check on yourself. Mm -hmm. Just because you don't have any symptoms or not feeling bad, you do need to check. You're, yeah, you're absolutely right, Paula. And the, I think the take home point here from this, from Paula's story, is that Paula was smart enough to listen to her husband, <laughs> even though she rebelled, him, <laughs> as we all do. That's yeah? true. <laughs> and that normally it's the opposite. As, as yes, you know, it Dr. Is. Webster, the husband's are drag, the wives are dragging the husbands into the office. But this time he dragged you in yes, and saved did. your life. Right? Yes, he did. And Paula's lesion was caught early, and we were able to get it out. And you know, we're very, we're, we're, we're thankful. Talking about preventive health, uh, let me just um, um, stop for a second and just uh, uh, say to our audience that this show, the Caribbean Report and uh, My Preventive Health, uh, is coming to you on yes, it's coming to you on Comcast cable channel 24 if you're in Atlanta, and if you're outside of Atlanta, you can pick it up on the web at www. Uh, my People TV, www.peopletv.org, that's right, and uh, you, can, um, you can get us, uh, go to the right side of the page and click on the link there, and uh, you can watch us live. Um, now, Dr. Mack, as we come back, um, we want to uh, switch a little bit, gears a little bit, and talk to this uh, incredible uh, doctor across the way who is able to beat the disease that normally paralyzes, leaves people paralyzed. I know my wife, had a similar, had a friend, a classmate at law school who had a similar problem and then ended up with almost a year in the hospital, I think over a year in the hospital and still cannot walk. And here you are playing golf again after this disease. Tell us a little bit about this condition uh, and tell us a little bit, it's called transverse myelitis I know, but mm -hmm. I know you've been a practitioner of preventive health for years. Mm -hmm. I look at you, you're slim and trim and I, and I know that you, you eat well. Uh, you've traveled all over the world. Tell us a little bit about what happened to you, Dr. Webster. Well, um, I've, I've been involved in um, helping sporting teams to realize their true potential. So I'm, I'm prepared to work for the Cardinals if I get an offer. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> um, and I was in India helping the Indian cricket team. Yeah. And while I was there, I got something like the flu, flu-like illness. And then I went back home and I thought I'd gotten over it. And then one morning I woke up and I tried to sit up in bed and I couldn't sit up, I had no balance. Wow. Then I tried to move my legs and I found that uh, the will was there, but the legs wouldn't move. So I realized that I was paralyzed from my waist down. Wow. And um, I had no control of my bladder or anything. And it just came on suddenly like that. It was a, it was a terrifying thing. No feeling, no movement, nothing, no balance. So I was taken to the hospital in, um, in Barbados, and they started to look, look after me there. And while I was lying in bed, you know, I, I remembered uh, what some Buddhist priest told me in Sri Lanka when I worked there years ago, that um, when you're faced with any challenge, first of all, you must um, have love and kindness for yourself first, well, for the Almighty first, then yourself, and then for the people around you. And the second thing was that you must have a proper insight into reality and what, what is really happening with you without distorting it or magnifying it in any way. 
And the third one was uh, communication, and mainly communicating with yourself in a very positive way. So those were some of the things on which I built my recovery. And I also knew that, you know, medical treatment, well, you had like, it's like three legs. The first one is that you take a whole heap of pills, and that's the most popular one that everybody <laughs> gets so wrapped up in. The second one is um, intervention, where they can do surgery on you, or they can give you um, oncology, or, or something like that. But the third one, and probably the most important, that is neglected very, very badly, is self-care. You take responsibility for healing yourself. That is what I did. And I also said, you know, look Webster, don't be an imposter. You have been teaching athletes and sportsmen all around the world about how to perform better using all these fancy techniques. Use them on yourselves. But I came to terms with the situation and I said, look, if I don't re recover from this illness, I won't be able to walk. I changed my lifestyle, but I still have my most valuable assets. That's my mouth <laughs> and my brain. <laughs> so that is where I started from. And um, then I started to employ the techniques that I've been teaching athletes about how to improve their own performance. And it was really about the power of the mind, um, the visualization mainly. And um, every night I used to visualize myself playing golf at my favorite courses here in the United States, <laughs> playing well, playing different shots very well, and winning. This is while you were on your back. While I was <laughs> on my back, and I had a lot of time to do that. Wow. So, um, I, I mean, I, I must have made oh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of replay of that tape. Mm -hmm. And I said to the doctors in, if I think it was February or late January, I said, I'm going to the United States in June. I'm going to play golf at my favorite golf courses. And they said, look, you're a medical doctor, don't be stupid, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're not be realistic, again. You, yeah. you cannot, uh, this is incredible. Yeah. And I said, okay, but I kept on with that. And oh, incidentally, your good friend, Reverend Hall, was my spiritual advisor. Uh -huh. He's a famous Barbados cricketer. Yeah. And he came in one night and prayed with me for an hour. I thought he wasn't going to stop, <laughs> so I knew <laughs> I was going to get better. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> Um, I started to recover and recover. By June, I was in the United States. Wow. wow. And I started to play golf. Wonderful. You know, I was walking again. But I had to learn how to sit up. Right. I had to learn how to turn on my tummy and crawl like a baby. Wow. Right? I had to learn then how to stand. Wow. How to take the first step, how to walk with a walker, right. and then how to walk with a cane and eventually. And that took some time. But That's I was remarkable. determined oh, right. because in my mind, the thing about recovery is not about what you want. It's about seeing what you want as already achieved. Mm -hmm. So when I was seeing myself playing golf, I mean, the mind was working. And, you know, there was a great um, a Russian scientist many years ago who said that human experience is not only influenced by your um, experiences, human behavior, not just by your experiences, but the, the images that you create in your mind about the future, mm -hmm. right? And not only does the mind create these images, but it does everything in its power to bring those things about. Mm -hmm. So this was the theory on which I was working. Anyhow, uh, when I came up, this is a funny bit of, when I came up to the United States, I went to the golf course, my friends were waiting for me. <laughs> One of my friends said to the others, oh, you know, Rudy is coming up, you know, he was paralyzed and we have to be kind to him, you know. And <laughs> I don't know if he can swing the golf club properly. You know, his balance is poor. <laughs> poor Rudy syndrome. And I played <laughs> along with him. And then we started to play. And I was hitting the ball straight. And I think I did very well. I beat most of them. Yeah. <laughs> and then the, the abuse started. You know, you're an imposter, but there's nothing wrong with you, etc., <laughs> etc. Et but the, the purpose of this story is, is to tell you that pills and medicines and surgery can only do so much. Yes. I think the majority of the healing is controlled by you That's and what true. goes on in your mind. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a healing energy inside of you. I think there's a healing energy that comes from the Creator as well. When you put the two of them together, it is very uh, powerful. That is why prayer, along with these mental visualizations, mm -hmm. are so powerful.
Well, that is and that is something that I think that um, you yeah. talk about preventive medicine. Right. I think that is, that that can cure a lot of right. a lot of the problems that right. we have. At least diminish them a bit. Well, no, you're, I mean you're absolutely right. And when we developed the module for preventive health and my preventive health, an important part of that module was uh, really spirituality was one part of it, mm -hmm. and also all of the all of the social aspects of, of, of medicine and also motivation, mm. all those are parts of preventive health. In case, for those of you who are watching us uh, on channel, we are on uh, channel 24, Comcast. We are speaking with Dr. Rudy Webster, uh, who is the former ambassador to Washington, but who is, was telling us this incredible story of how he literally willed himself back from paralyzing illness that had him uh, crawling like a baby and on his back and finally back to the point where he could play golf and beat some of his old friends in golf. Right. And we have also on the set with us uh, um, Mrs. Paula, who was telling us her story of how she used her preventive health to beat colon cancer and wanted to encourage all of the ladies in the audience to get their screening at their colon cancer screening at age 50, especially with the new data that shows that uh, black women in America, I think, seem to have a very much increased incidence of colon polyps, which are the precursors of colon cancer, the little lesions that lead to colon cancer. Uh, so we will have more of these incredible stories uh, in the weeks to come, and we encourage you to continue to watch, uh, watch a Caribbean Report and also continue to watch us on uh, my page, on my page, the My Preventive Health, which is uh, which is, uh, follows, immediately follows the Caribbean report. Uh, you can also uh, go to www.myphvoice uh, and you can download the, uh, some of the, uh, the early things that you should be looking for uh, to tell you whether you, if you're less than age 50, whether you should be screened, you should go to your doctor and have colon cancer screening performed. Uh, Dr. Matt, you've been quiet in the background, but you had some last minute questions. Well, um, just to go over some of the um, indications for colon screening, uh, prior to even age 50, you're looking at, you know, any change of bowel habits, like you've said, anything from diarrhea to constipation and back and forth. Um, most important, any type of rectal bleeding right. of any sort, right. um, anywhere you need to be have any type of investigation right. and always go to your doctor right. and ask the questions in order to see right. if uh, making sure the colonoscopy is an indication for you. Sure. And one of the biggest thing is family history. Yeah, family history, absolutely. And definitely right. something right. that right. you need to find out right. through your mother's side and your father's side right. who had f cancer period as well as colon cancer right. specifically right. and that way it's it's a precursor right. to you know get yourself checked out in order to right. make yourself and of course we couldn't leave this section without talking about diet because I know you're fastidious with your own diet yeah. and Paula you've changed your diet I know that yes mm -hmm. since, since your colon cancer screening and many people ask us Dr. Mack as you know um, what should we do if we had to do to protect our colon what should we do to protect and very quickly uh, the, I want you to remember the word crucify. Crucify cruciferous vegetables, and those are uh, cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, asparagus. These, it seems as if these all contain some ingredients that seem to uh, scrub your insides and help to protect the immune system of your colon. So uh, if you want a, one takeaway point for your diet, add more cruciferous vegetables. And of course, it, it's, uh, Dr. Rudy, you know that we all encourage them to eat lots of greens and, uh, and, and, and vegetables and, uh, and um, to watch your, your weight, of course. We're all doing that here on the show, right? right. Good. Well, thank you for joining us on, uh, on the Caribbean Report. And thank you for joining us on My Preventive Health. We look forward to seeing you next week where we continue some more of these exciting shows with you uh, and the Caribbean Report and My Preventive Health. Dr. Webster, we're happy that you were able to uh, share this incredible story and call us. Uh, we bless you for sharing your story with the ladies and uh, help you then to uh, save some life. And uh, we always say on uh, My Preventive Health, uh, we encourage you to share preventive health because the life you save may be your own. And so that's uh, the, the, uh, the uh, Dr. Webster, this is uh, such a great opportunity to see you. I, I really must find out more about how you 
uh, we can reel ourselves into, into, uh, into doing this. Uh, do you, do you, uh, car amour m'avait caché déception et ses liens particuliers avec trahison cette trahison qui m'a fait connaître mes fiances qui m'a clairement mis en garde contre confiance confiance c'est bien foutu de moi avec sourire et joie et trois on fait de moi Kerry James le mélancolique mon enfance rime avec absence de fric de père d'affection de repère j'ai une rage intérieure qui pourrait exploser j'ai grandi en banlieue parmi les nez bronzés J'ai plus à qui me fier Mon existence est regrettée Pour une grande vie sacrifiée Les mots dépassent Les pensées on en vient en découdre Parce qu'on s'aime La haine périme aussi vite Qu'un coup de foudre On s'efforce de résoudre Les problèmes Mon redoute qui reviennent Telle une césarienne Qui serait ouf Qui fort coudre Seul au monde Surtout quand la nuit tombe Je prends le périph' pour rien Et c'est en vain Je mes potes Sur messagerie Je à la première porte Je reviens sur mes potes